Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to go through, still in Unit 1, Topic 1.4, Composition and Mixtures. Uh, for this one, we're going to look at what different types of mixtures are, homogenous, heterogeneous, and go through a little bit about using uh, just some elemental analysis to determine relative numbers of atoms in a substance to determine purity. Uh, we're also going to go through and look at a couple of experimental ways that you can separate out mixtures. So the first thing that we want to do is one, just look at what molecules look like whenever they're in different states. For solids, liquids, and gases, you know that they're going to have different molecular configurations. The molecules are going to line up a little differently. This is something that comes up pretty often in the AP exam. They want you to know about the representation of molecules. In other words, they want you to look at these little pictures of molecules and be able to use them and read them, describe molecules using these representations or pictures. Uh, they want you to look at these representations and generate ideas from them, be able to read these pictures. For that, let's kind of just run through these real quick. These are all going to be water. Looking at these representations, I like to call it going down to molecule town. In other words, we know kind of in the big world what, what these substances look like, but down in molecule town, what are the, the molecules actually doing? So for solids, uh, like solid ice, the molecules are going to be very rigid, very solid, and uh, they're not moving around a whole lot. In fact, molecular motion, the only real molecular motion that a solid has is vibrational. The, the atoms are just vibrating back and forth. Whereas if it's a liquid, uh, like liquid water, then the it has vibrational motion, but it also has rotational motion. So these molecules are rotating in space. And since they're rotating in space, they're going to be breaking those intermolecular forces and won't keep them as rigid and solid as they once were. They're rotating around and kind of slipping and sliding all over the place. Uh, this is one reason why liquid has its property of being able to slip and slide, fill in spaces, and so on so on and so forth. Because the molecules are rotating and falling over each other, liquids are going to try to spread out and fill their container. If you're wanting to fill the entire container, then you're going to need a gas. So a gaseous water like steam, it has that vibrational motion. It also has the rotational motion. Additionally, it has translational motion. It moves from point A to point B in space. It can uh, you can move around. At that point, there's not a whole lot of those intermolecular forces uh, keeping it steady and still in one place. Those intermolecular forces are, are going to be a lot weaker because of the amount of kinetic energy these molecules actually have. Next thing that we need to talk about is the difference between a pure substance and a mixture. So when we say a substance, we're talking about a certain amount of stuff. Like I can say this rod, I can say a bowl of something, I can say a container of something, I can say, you know, uh, the air that's in this room. Uh, you can basically say all of these things are substances. Now, is that substance pure? If it's pure, that means it has one type of thing in it, which means it has, uh, for example, this aluminum rod has one type of atom in it. It is aluminum. That's it. Uh, if I said I had a glass of pure water, that means it has nothing but H2O in it. If it's a, you know, a little pile of salt, that means it's going to have nothing but sodium chloride in it. Those are all going to be pure substances. So that's going to be a mixture of things. Like if I take pure salt and I put some pepper in it and I mix those together, that's going to be a mixture. Now I have uh, two different types of molecules, two different types of formula units all mixed together in a thing. I was hungry when I made this slideshow, so I put a picture of some uh, like Asian uh, rice bean uh, food here. You can tell that there's a lot of different stuff going on here. We have carbohydrates, we got some water in there, we got lots of proteins, we can probably have some salt, we have some uh, various spices in there as well, all sorts of different stuff, all mixed around to make this delicious looking 
uh, dish. So this is most definitely a mixture. You are a mixture. You contain several different types of molecules. Looking at uh, different types of mixtures now, uh, we have homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. Uh, homogeneous mixture is anything that is so well mixed up that all of the molecules are kind of evenly distributed across all of it. There's not one part that has mostly sodium chloride and one part that's mostly uh, pepper. It's going to be evenly distributed across it. Uh, one way that I usually uh, think about it is if I take a small sample of this, if I cut it in half and kind of separate the two, uh, two cups of coffee here, then one side is going to have the exact same proportions of stuff as the other side. So if I, I don't drink my coffee uh, with milk or sugar, but if I did, and I put some sugar and milk in there, and I stirred it up, and I poured half of the cup, if I poured the cup in half and poured it half in one cup, half in the other cup, they're going to have that same proportion of sugar and milk and coffee it's because it's a homogenous mixture. Whereas a heterogeneous mixture, I kind of think of it like salsa, you know, has tomatoes and onions and, and guacamole and, and corn and all everything else that's in there. But if I take a chip and I scoop some out, I might get a chip full of nothing but tomatoes or mostly tomatoes and a little bit of onion. Or I could go back in for the next bite and get mostly onion and a little bit of corn or something like that no tomatoes at all it's it's not fully mixed up so if we wanted to go down to molecule town and look at a molecular representation of different mixtures uh, we can see here that a homogeneous mixture you can see that the light and dark gray uh, particles are you know pretty well spread out and evenly spread out across this entire thing whereas a heterogeneous mixture we have little clumps going on we have a clump of dark over here and a clump of light over here these are not very uniformly distributed. So that is a difference between heterogeneous and a homogeneous mixture. All right, so you have different mixtures. What can you do with them? Um, well, sometimes we don't want them to be mixture. We want to purify that. We want, we have a bunch of alcohol mixed in with water, uh, but I don't want alcohol mixed with water. I want just pure water. What can I do to separate the, this mixture. Well, there are three different separation methods that we can think about today. And the first one is going to be distillation. So let's say we have that alcohol water mixture. I can heat that mixture up and alcohol has a much lower boiling point than water. Uh, alcohol is going to turn into a gas long before water does. So if I heat up that mixture, that alcohol is going to come up in its gas form while the water remains liquid. So this gas form is going to come up here and go down this tube and hit this, this cooling jacket. So it's gonna lower the temperature of the, of the alcohol gas, turning it back into a liquid. It's gonna run down and collect here. Now, once we have gotten most of that, most of the alcohol, we can remove that collection uh, flask and now we have separated out the water from the alcohol. That's one method of separating out mixtures. This method separates mixtures based on its boiling point. Each different separation method is going to separate based on some different property. And in distillation's case, we're mixing, uh, we're separating based on boiling point. The next thing we're going to think about is filtration. Filtration is where you have some paper, some sort of filter paper, and this paper will allow small particles to go through, but large particles it will hold back. So this is going to be separation based on particle size. I think most people have, have, have filtered something in their life, either through like a sieve or, or even just made coffee. That's an example of, of uh, filtration. So we have larger particles being held up, smaller particles going through separation based on particle size. All right, the next one is chromatography. In this, we have some sort of chromatography paper, some filter paper. We're gonna take a mixture. In this case, we're talking about ink. Ink is actually a mixture of, very, a, lot of, different, uh, of a lot of different substances. And we can put ink, in, uh, blob it onto this paper, and then put the very end of the paper into some sort of solvent. Now, some of you might remember that solvents will dissolve things. Solvents dissolve solutes. So a solvent is going to dissolve some of the substances in the ink spot 
And as the solvent raises up through the paper using capillary action, the substances that dissolve from the ink spot are going to travel right up along with it, the, the water uh, or whatever solvent you're using. And some of the substances don't dissolve very well. They take a little bit of time to dissolve. And so those guys are going to be a little bit later to the party. They're going to dissolve a little bit less. They're going to they kind of lag behind. So that is how these guys separate or how chromatography separates. It's based on solubility. How well does the substance dissolve in the solvent? If it dissolves really well, it goes straight up. If it dissolves less well, it's going to be further down the paper. So we have three different methods here of separating, uh, separating out mixtures. One is distillation. Uh, where it separates based on boiling point, one is filtration based on particle size, and one is chromatography based on the solubility of the substance. Okay, so there's one more thing that I want to talk about today, and that's uh, how can you go through and looking at kind of uh, what they call elemental analysis. If you use a mass spec to get the relative abundance of each different type of element in a certain substance, how can you use that information in order to come up with information on whatever it is you're working on? So let me kind of give through and talk about a scenario here. I have two beakers. We'll say this is beaker A and this is beaker B. And they both have 10 grams of stuff in them okay and now i know that one of these guys is going to be mostly sodium chloride but it, it's a mixture it's going to have a little bit of potassium chloride as well these are two different types of salts so it's a mixture uh this is sodium chloride but it has a little bit of, of potassium chloride impurity in it and we have another one that's mostly potassium chloride, but a little bit of sodium chloride impurity in it. Now, how can you go through and just looking at the relative abundances of these guys, uh, tell which one is which? Now, you could go through and say, oh, we'll just check to see which one has more potassium or which one has more sodium, and that will solve that issue. There's another way of going about it, and this is kind of how I want you to think about things. Sometimes in, in research or just in science in general, you're kind of stuck because you can't do one particular thing, so you have to come up with a, a weird alternate way of going about things. Uh, in this case, I'm going to show you that you can do this same thing. You can tell which one goes where if you just look at the chlorine, just by looking at chlorine. Let's think about it for a second. Both of these containers have 10 grams, right? Okay, and that's going to be our first piece of information. It's the same mass in each beaker. Now, which one of these guys... Or what's the difference between the sodium chloride and potassium chloride? What's going to be a big difference here? Well, obviously one has sodium and one has potassium. And if you look at a periodic table, you see that the sodium weighs a lot less than the potassium. Ah, okay. So that means that potassium weighs more than the sodium these are both the same amount of mass, there must be a lot less number of formula units in this situation than there are here. Here we're gonna have more number of formula units. So if there's more formula units here, less here, I can go through and just see how much chlorine we have in each of these guys. And whichever one has the, the most chlorine is gonna be this one with sodium chloride. And whichever one has less chlorine is going to be the one with mostly potassium chloride. 
So that's one test you can do. So that's going to save you a lot of time, energy, and effort just by looking at chlorine. So doing uh, an elemental analysis like that, you can go through and infer a lot more information than you would think. All right, so that's going to be all we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, tomorrow, I'm probably going to put up some more videos. Hope everyone is staying safe out there. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Practice good social distancing. Don't don't really, you know, head to a rave. You guys do raves? Eh, whatever. Anyway, have the, a safe, fun time out there. And I will see you guys next time.